Hi, always exciting to see everybody pop into the room. Hi. <laughs> welcome, welcome everyone. As people are still joining, I wanna introduce myself. I'm Jessica Frank. I'm the Biomed Program Manager here at the Marion Institute. Um, I'm happy and excited to be doing a May BioBytes for you all. And if you're unfamiliar with BioBytes, I wanna say welcome, welcome. And um, BioBytes is the Marion Institute's monthly virtual educational series. BioBytes connects you with some of the most uh, foremost experts in alternative natural and biological medicine today, speaking on key topics relating to wellness and empowered health. That is what we're here to talk about today. So our very special topic in recognition of May as being Mental Health Awareness Month is mindfulness. What is it? How can we practice it formally? And most importantly, how can we incorporate it into our daily lives? So helping us dive deep into the present moment with a taste of mindfulness today is Colleen Kamenish. Colleen has been teaching the seminal eight-week mindfulness-based stress reduction program for more than 15 years. And she has taught numerous modified programs and retreats at many large companies and hospitals including a program for victims of trauma at Spalding Rehab in Boston and pr a program for judges through the National Judicial College. She is also the founder of the Mindfulness Standard, which is an online resource that matches individuals with highly qualified mindfulness teachers. I have several announcements before we get started. First, this is a more interactive episode of BioBytes. So we'll be doing a guided mindfulness meditation later on. So you wanna stay tuned for that, it's exciting. Second, don't forget that we encourage everyone to drop questions into the chat as we go along. So we'll be keeping an eye on the chat and those questions will then be asked at the end of Colleen's presentation. Third, I wanna go ahead and announce that our next BioBytes will be on June 6th, Tuesday, June 6th, Eastern time. At noon, our topic will be heart rate variability, and we'll have guest expert Guy Odishaw, who is the co-founder of Cerebral Fit, on board with us. We'll drop that link to register into the chat for you. Last but not least, this is going to be recorded. It is recorded, but uh, it is being recorded, and you will receive the recording after the presentation, and also some resources within a few days. So without further delay, I'm going to pass it off to Colleen to talk about a taste of mindfulness today. Thanks so much. Welcome, Colleen. Thank you. I'm so happy to be here. I'm happy to see everyone that's joining. Um, well, those of you I can see and happy to welcome everybody um, whose names I can see. And I do hope that it will be an interactive session. Um, I always like, I think it's much better to, to kind of draw from you than me just to send a bunch of information out at you. So I'd love to hear your voices as, as we get started. So let me just share my PowerPoint. All right. So again, this is a, a little taste of mindfulness. That's how I think of it. I'll be giving you, um, just a little bit of information about what mindfulness is. And I know that uh, many, many people have a sense of what mindfulness is these days. And, and yet I think it can be really helpful to actually define it and to um, talk about it together, because I think there can also be a lot of misperceptions about what mindfulness is. We'll talk a little bit about how it works. Um, there's a lot of exciting things happening in the field uh, that, that help us know that mindfulness isn't just impacting the way that people feel, because people often feel better after they do a course, but it actually uh, makes structural changes to the brain. And, and we now know that through uh, neuroscience. We'll talk about the benefits of mindfulness and then some ways that you can become more mindful. And as Jessica mentioned, we'll be doing a practice together. I think, you know, for a lot of people there can be listening to a podcast about mindfulness or, or reading a book about it and you know, the heart of mindfulness is really in the experiential practice. So we'll make sure to, to dive into that and explore it a little bit together. So I'll start by opening it up to the room. And um, 
you can just, I think it should work well enough to unmute yourself. And I'd love to hear, we can kind of popcorn this out. What, what, it, when you think about mindfulness, what do you think that it is? So anybody willing to share? I always think about the UMass program where they had the participants eat one pea and it took them 10 minutes or something to eat it. <laughs> yes, yes, thank you for bringing that in. So yeah, we have a raisin eating activity <laughs> that we did at, at, at UMass and that's a part of the MBSR program. And it is where people kind of use all of their senses to explore eating a raisin. Um, and often what people discover after they've, you know, looked, I often encourage people to imagine that they've dropped in from another planet. They've never seen this object before. And just to describe, you know, visually, what do you notice texture wise? How does it feel? What do you smell when you're smelling the raisin? Uh, you can even listen to the raisins and they give you some information about how they are. You know, they're kind of a squishy sound. Um, and at the end of that, when people actually start to eat the raisin, often what they describe is, I felt like it was super flavorful, or I've never experienced, I've never eaten just one raisin, and I didn't know how rich that experience could be. And one of the things, one of the qualities that mindfulness can really help us cultivate is feeling more connected to our lives. And that connection comes from actually paying close attention to what's happening. Like, and, and to me, this is one of my favorite mindfulness practices because it's not about closing your eyes or finding some soundproof room that you can, you know, achieve some kind of a state. It's really about if I just pay attention in a particular way to what I'm doing while I'm doing it and I'm all in the experience it changes something about that experience. And that's true whether you're eating a raisin or whether you're having a conversation with someone you love and you're all in, someone's not looking at their phone while they're talking to you. Uh, so it's really this idea of feeling connected because of the level of awareness we're bringing to experiences. So it's a great starting point, thank you. What else? What else when you think about what mindfulness is, what you think of? I see some folks out there. Feel free just to unmute or we can unmute you. I think of mindfulness as um, being intentional rather than just being on autopilot. Yes. Thank you. Yes. Yeah, so oftentimes, you know, if we don't have something like a mindfulness practice, we can be it just as you described in this kind of auto automatic pilot mode where we're kind of going through the motions of, of things that we often do, and maybe even sort of having habitual thought processes and patterns and uh, way, certain ways that we might be reacting to certain situations. And it's just kind of pre-programmed based on the experience that we've had in the world. With mindfulness practice, what we start to do is we actually, when we're meditating, we start to notice when the mind drifts off, where does it actually go? And, and for many people, they don't know that at first. At first, it's like, it's just going to places that it will first, I think people are often kind of alarmed at how often their mind drifts off. And then it might just seem random. And after a while, we, we start to get a sense of some of our habits or patterns, or even the things that might be driving a lot of our behaviors, but we may not be consciously thinking too much about until we start to bring more attention to it. And the same could be said for the body, um, especially in this kind of modern world that we're living in. The body can kind of be left out. Many things that we do happen from a very cognitive perspective, like even traveling now, if you're in a car, it's much more um, mental than physical or even trying to get on public transportation. It's like you're figuring out logistics, you're kind of going through planning um, and we can kind of leave out what's the information that the body is giving us. And yet the body experiences everything first and gives us a lot of information. So by bringing more attention to what's happening in the body and what's happening in the mind, we actually can be much more intentional about the choices that we make and about what is actually driving us forward in our life. Is it just based on a bunch of patterns and habits that I'm not that aware of? 
or am I consciously choosing how I want my life to be and what I want it to look like? So that's another great one. It'd be great to maybe get one, one more idea out there. You're also welcome to put it in the chat and yep. you can also, you don't have to put your video on if you don't, if you want to just do your audio and say something, you are welcome to do that too. So it's all available. Well, I've, I've heard mindfulness um, defined as sustained present moment awareness, which sounds to me like very cerebral. So I think of it as a holistic, but it is, like you said, it incorporates the mind and the body and maybe even more than that. Yeah, and you can be mindful doing anything. <laughs> that's <laughs> right. Sitting. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. So one, you can be mindful doing anything. It's just bringing when I, if I think about a word that's the closest to mindfulness, I think of the word awareness. And while that seems maybe really like, oh, that, what's the big deal about awareness? Think about it this way. If you're not aware of something, it's impossible to change it. This, the, the moment you become aware of what's happening, all of a sudden the possibility to start to change is there, but we have to know that something's happening. So there's this quality of awareness that mindfulness helps us cultivate. And you also talked about being in the present moment. And another way of, um, another definition I've heard is uh, non-judgmental present moment attention. So that's even like another level, right? So uh, very often we tend to either be sort of predicting into the future or planning. Um, many of you might feel familiar with that, like all the emails or the to-do list or all of those, you know, what's going to happen next. Um, so people can really be living their lives in the future and kind of almost willfully missing their present moments. Um, and and what we know is that people that have that tendency to lean towards the future also have more anxiety. And the reason for that is if you stop and think about it, if you really think about it, this is the only moment we know anything about. Everything in the past has already happened. Everything in the future is actually a prediction or a guess but we don't actually know what will happen in the future. And we know that we don't know. <laughs> and so that's where the anxiety comes from. It's like the, the trying to control something that we don't actually know. And on the other hand, people that tend to live in the past have a tendency toward depression because the past has already happened. And um, there can be a lot of comparing, like, I don't know, COVID feels like a really easy thing to bring up or what was easier when life was dot, dot, dot. Right. Or for some people in the past, life may have been much more challenging. And then there could be this fear about how that might show up in the future. So we don't want to spend our time living really too much in the future or in the past. It doesn't mean that we don't draw on those. Right. Like it's important to know what happened in the past in an intentional way so that we don't repeat it. Also important to plan for the future, but without grasping it too tightly because we know we can't predict it. But more often than not, if we can stay right here in the present moment, this is the moment where we, we can grow, where we can change, where we can learn. So it's a really powerful place to be. And then bringing this quality of non-judgmental awareness. Like, what if I could be in the present moment and notice, let's just use an example, what's happening in, in the thoughts in my mind or in my body without judging it? Because often especially when there are things we don't like, the very next thing that happens is judgment. Um, and with mindfulness, we can just sort of like notice how am I relating to these different aspects of my life? And that can give us a way of not being so reactive in our day-to-day -day life. And I'll, I'll describe that a little bit more as we move forward. So thank you all so much. I do see something in the chat here too. I'm thinking of numbing out or not numbing out. Yeah. So um, some of the time what we can do is like kind of holding on to things or pushing away from things. Pushing away might be that numbing out. And with mindfulness, it's really about wanting to be present, wanting to know something about what's happening in this moment, even if it's challenging and being able to cultivate the resources internally so that we can show up to those challenges. So again, just a quick review. Mindfulness is a, is a way that we can kind of stop and notice things in a more objective way, that non-judgmental quality. Um, 
And, and rather than getting caught up in like problem solving mode. So noticing what's happening while we're in the moment, it again, allows us to start to notice some of our maybe habitual habits and patterns and have more choices around that. Mindfulness can also help us start to see things um, without our normal filters or lenses or judgments. And that is really powerful. Actually, mindfulness is one of the only practices we know that can actually change implicit bias. So implicit bias means it's happening sort of subconsciously. But with mindfulness, we actually move below the conscious level just enough that we can start to notice some of those things definitely helps us come out of the chronic stress cycle um, and stay in the present moment more often. So tons and tons of benefits on mindfulness. This is just like the briefest slide, but you could Google the benefits um, and find so many, but people tend to feel more connected to their lives, more energy. Oftentimes people sleep better. It can have an impact. Um, I would say that the research I've seen doesn't necessarily mean it reduces chronic pain, but that people can start to relate to their pain differently. Uh, it improves heart function, mood, happiness, definitely helps with concentration. So there are just tons and tons of benefits out there. And I always like to use the taste of mindfulness to share a little bit about the history of mindfulness. I'll do it in a very brief way. Um, and, and we know that mindfulness dates back thousands and thousands of years, at least 2,500 years, but probably even farther than that. Um, and so the, the history of mindfulness I'll specifically talk about is kind of in the last 44 years as mindfulness has been sort of brought forward to the West. And I'll also be specifically talking about secular mindfulness. So um, not really referencing Buddhist philosophy, but just um, programs like mindfulness-based stress reduction. So John Kabat-Zinn, he um, has a PhD in molecular biology. He graduated with honors from MIT, and he was this brilliant scientist. And um, he actually was being trained by somebody who had won the Nobel Prize. And I think they had this really, um, or mentor, not trained, but I think they had these aspirations about what his career would be like. And then... Um, John went to work for UMass Medical School. That was one of his first jobs out of um, graduate school. And when he got there, he started to realize that there were a lot of people that medicine was not going to be able to cure per se. And then he actually did an informal survey with the physicians there and started asking of all the patients you have, how many do you think you can just like cure whatever they're coming in with? And it was a relatively small number. And again, that was like 44 years ago. Um, but he knew that there were people that were going to be left with chronic disease or chronic Ill, um, illness, sometimes terminal uh, diagnosis. Um, and so he was a longtime meditator and he also had a very extensive yoga practice. And he had this idea, like, what if I created something complementary to medicine? So not taking away from it, but in addition to. And so he created this eight week program called mindfulness based stress reduction participants come for two and a half hours once a week and are encouraged to meditate at home there's also a full day silent retreat component. And um, because he was a scientist he he studied everyone that came through the program. And it's also very lucky because he kind of pitched this idea to the, you know, executive suite. And again, this 44 years ago when yoga wasn't even popular yet. And they, they let him do it. They gave him a spot in the basement of the hospital and doctors started referring their patients. Um, and they could see tremendous benefits in a very short period of time. They were seeing um, health conditions change quite a bit. They started with things like psoriasis and folks with chronic pain and, um, not, not only were they noticing that their health issues were changing, but also their mental health was improving. People were, were reporting less anxiety and less depression. And so the kind of second thing, the second wave after all of the health conditions was um, the field of psychology really catching on to this and seeing like there are some components that are really helpful here for mental health. Um, and so now this is a part of a lot of different um, Psychological intervention, interventions like DBT and ACT and CBT, so they they all have different um, components of mindfulness, and um, 
And if you Googled any of the health conditions, you could Google almost anything now and mindfulness-based stress reduction and see research around it. And then the third wave, and that's really where I think the field is right now, neuroscientists got really interested in this. Like what is changing? What is actually happening here that people are doing um, so much better? And so what they could see is that there are changes actually happening in the brain that are creating these kinds of benefits. And the other thing that I'll say about this program, so participants are encouraged to meditate 45 minutes per day at home as, as they take this program and that they've done longitudinal studies like five years after participants graduate and 90% of the people are still practicing. So it's a big number. And the reason that I like to talk about this particular history of mindfulness is that there are a lot of different mindfulness interventions out there, including apps, and I support all of them. Well, many of them, all of the ones that, yeah, I think there's a lot of people doing a really um, good job with those and bringing them forward in really ethical ways. Um, and it doesn't necessarily mean that doing 10 minutes of practice will have any impact on um, how you feel. And so I just think it's important for people to know that mindfulness-based stress reduction, where people are encouraged to practice every day for 45 minutes, is the methodology around almost all the research we have of the positive impacts of meditation. And I think we know there was one paper that came out that showed it was a minimum of at least 20 minutes of practice a day that it takes to have structural changes in the brain. So I just think that's important for folks to know. I kind of think of um, no one would get on a treadmill at this point. Now that we know enough about cardiovascular health, you would never get on a treadmill once for 10 minutes and think like, okay, like I have better heart health now, but people I think do have that perception about meditation. And sometimes I feel like it even gets marketed that way. So it really is, um, it, it's like building our, our, our mental muscle that we have to practice it. We have to practice it consistently over time to really have those benefits. Um, so how does it work? I'll talk a little bit about the neuroscience in a very, very basic way. Um, so neuroplasticity is the ability of the, the, the brain to organize these different connection points. Um, so for many, many years, scientists thought that once you reach a certain age, your brain is just how it's going to be. And then they could see when people had things like strokes, that they were able to relearn and reform these neural pathway connections. And I like to think of them like highway systems in the mind. So if you've practiced a habit over and over, it's a big highway system, like maybe like what we see in LA where you have eight lanes wide. Um, and then you might have other things you've done once or twice. And that's like a little country road that, that you're driving on. And so neuroplasticity means that we actually can change the way that the brain is over time. And with meditators, what we know um, is that they make certain connections. So I'll just give you very basics on the brain. The lower brain handles things like automatic functioning, things that are critical to survival, but that we don't consciously think about things like breathing, um, heart regulation, temperature. The midbrain is where we kind of live our emotional lives. So that's where, you know, memory processing, um, liking or disliking is in that part of the brain. And then the, the top part of the brain is what I like to think of like the executive control function of the brain. So it kind of made it the decision maker of the brain and especially the prefrontal cortex has a lot to do with self-regulation and self-discipline. And what we can see happens with meditators is they start to make a lot of connections between the prefrontal cortex and the mid part of the brain. So what does that mean? Well, oftentimes when we have stressors, or we could call it a stimulus, that often what happens is a kind of automatic reactivity or an automatic reaction. Um, and that's when our our lower brain is kind of doing its work. It's keeping us alive. It's helping us react to situations. But often in this situation, um, it, it's kind of an unexamined response. And probably everybody in this room has had a moment where you think, oh, I wish I could just take back what I just said or undo the email that I just sent. Um, and with mindfulness, what happens is that people actually they, they say things like, I felt like I just had a little bit more space or a little bit more time. And that's kind of like these little areas here. 
And that space or time that they're feeling actually has something to do with those neural pathway connections between the prefrontal cortex and the mid part of the brain, giving us more ability to self-regulate even under stressful situations. And so the biggest difference between this one, stressor and reaction, and this one is with enough awareness here and here, there's actually a choice. There's actually a choice about how we respond. So unfortunately, no amount of mindfulness will undo the fact that life itself is stressful. But with um, mindfulness practice, we get to choose more and more how we want to be in relationship with the stressors that are coming up in our lives. And, you know, what is stress? I think the simplest way to describe stress is our perceived, it's when our perceived demands start to exceed our perceived abilities. Um, and this might feel true, too many bills to pay, not enough time to pay the bills, too many things to do, not enough time to do all of the things. But I'm curious, and just to hear from all of you, what do these two things have in common? And you could put it in the chat too. I see in the chat, perceived, yes. So the perception of stress is just as impactful. Like whether stress is a real stress or a perceived stress or our body reacts to it the same way. So um, if we can start to have more clear seeing around, is this an actual threat or a perceived threat? It can start to help us have less stress. And sometimes too, it can be helpful just to list this out. What are my perceived demands and what are my abilities to meet those demands? And sometimes I know for myself, I have way more unrealistic, not actual demands that I can cross off the list. Um, and sometimes we might need to add abilities. So it can be a way to kind of help us balance out. And this I'll just briefly touch on just to say that not all stress, stress is bad. Stress can be really healthy if we have the right amount of it, it helps us perform well. Um, but you can see this imbalance zone is when stress becomes too much and it starts to become imbalanced. It starts to sort of tip us over into what can eventually lead to breakdown, especially if we don't know the signs of imbalance and developing more and more of an awareness practice can start to help us know what some of those signs are. So let's go ahead and do a practice together. And so just finding any comfortable posture, whatever feels right for you. And there's nothing so special about the posture, except that very often when people close their eyes and get relaxed, the next thing that happens is they fall asleep. And so I always like to think of the posture as a way to help support a sense of being awake and alert. If you'd like to, you can close your eyes, but there's also nothing special about closing the eyes. So you could also keep them open and take um, a gaze towards the wall in front of you or a window or the floor below you. We take in about 80% of the information that we receive visually. And so just by closing the eyes, we can actually minimize a lot of that stimulus. But it's also the same if we look at uh, the wall in front of us that doesn't have too much going on. And for this practice, I'd like to just take you through a few different anchors of attention. You can kind of explore them. And we'll start by bringing awareness to just the bottoms of the feet. And of course, I can't see everybody that's on this um, this class that we're doing. And so I'm going to offer different anchors. So if one of them is not available to you, you'll have another anchor that you can go to and you can choose what feels right for you. But if it's available to you, and if you can sense the bottoms of the feet, maybe just bringing awareness to that experience. And you might notice just the, the sensations of contact or pressure, the feet in contact with the surface below you. If you have shoes on, you might notice the comfort level of the shoes or the temperature of the feet. So many different sensations that might make us aware of the experience of the feet in this moment.
and maybe if it's possible aware of the stability the support of the ground beneath you at least in this particular moment You might also be aware of the seat, just the felt sense of sitting on whatever surface is supporting the body, or you might even be lying down. And one of the things that we can experience is the sensations of gravity just through the experience of the weight of the body. Or you might notice pressure or contact. Or again, you might have some awareness of how comfortable or not the surface you're sitting on is. And maybe aware of the, the support of whatever surface that you've chosen. And perhaps even allowing the body to be supported if that feels possible. And as we move through these practices, these different anchors of attention, the mind will likely drift off to other places. And I think it's important to know that that's just the nature of the mind the nature of the mind is kind of to be a random thought generator. And the moment you know the mind is gone, that's mindfulness. And then you have a choice about what to do with your attention. And so you could gently but firmly just bring the attention back to whatever anchor we're, we're attending to. In this case, just the sensations of sitting, sitting knowing that you're sitting. And the mind might drift off a thousand times and you can just bring it back a thousand times. I like to think of this as the practice of a thousand beginnings. So the next anchor that you could explore if you'd like to, and, and you're totally welcome to stay with one of the other two anchors and just keep practicing with those. But if you'd like to explore another anchor, you could bring attention to the palms of the hands wherever they're resting, if, if these sensations are available to you. If the hands are in contact with the, each, each other, you might notice something about the felt sense of that. Maybe there's heat or coolness. You might notice the hands resting on another part of the body on the legs or even on a surface. Just sort of the a tactile experience of the body in the present moment. What are the sensations? being received by the hands. And for the last part of this practice, I'll offer one more anchor of attention. And the, this anchor is the bird breath. And so for some people, you might notice the breath right at the tip of the nose as the breath is entering or leaving the body. For other people, there might be more awareness of the breath at the back of the throat as the breath moves in and out. For others, there might be more awareness of the breath with the expansion and contraction of the rib cage or the belly.
And we, we, when we do this practice, not trying to slow the breath down or to change it in any way, we're just breathing, knowing that we're breathing, actually experiencing what that process is like, no matter how the breath is. It actually can tell us a lot about how we are when we attend to the breath. And if this anchor is not that supportive for you, knowing you can stay with the feet, the seat, or the hands, And if you're staying with the breath, you might notice how you can never be in a future breath. And you can also not be in a past breath. And that's because the body is in the present moment. That's the only place it can actually be. It's the mind that can move off into the future or the past. And so all of these anchors of attention that we've been exploring are in the body because the body is in the present moment. And so it can be a really helpful place to bring the mind back to when the mind starts to drift off. We think about what anchors are, like an anchor on a boat. It's something that helps keep the boat from drifting too far away. And our body can really be that kind of an anchor. When the mind starts to drift off too far, we can just come back. And we can come back as many times as we need to. So just as you feel ready, maybe beginning to open the eyes if they've been closed, and you might even just take some moments to reorient to just the space that you're in, even before we come back to the screen. And then as you feel ready, maybe directing the attention back to our community here. And I have a few resources, but I think I might save those and come back to them. Um, and maybe just take a few moments to explore some shares about how this practice went today. So anybody that would want to share, you can again share either in the um, chat or in the large group. What did you notice? So somebody wrote really good. Glad you ended with the breath. Great. Thank you. And I think I'd like to remind people you can share the good, the bad, and the ugly. So it might not have been easy for everybody to do this practice, and that's equally useful. I could only focus on the rain outside. Yeah, and so actually sounds are another anchor of attention that we can bring awareness to. So if there's something strong like that that's capturing your attention that you can just stay with, that's great. It's a great anchor. I'm becoming more aware of this practice. Soothing pods is great, uh, and a free app. Great, thanks. How about some other experiences? What did you notice in the mind? Okay, so somebody noticed sleepiness. Um, and, and so that can come up on practices, um, especially if you're really tired. You know, it's like as soon as the body gets into a state of relaxation, it can kind of go to tiredness. Anchoring seems very useful for the busy mind. Yes. So I just always like to let people know that the mind drifting off is not a problem. People sometimes have this misperception about mindfulness that it's about clearing out all the thoughts and it's not about that. It's about when, when you have thoughts and you're, you become aware of it, the moment, you know, you're having thoughts, you're already back, you're mindful and then choosing what to do with our attention. And um, when we start to notice where the mind goes off to enough times, again, we might start to see the different habits and patterns of the mind. So somebody wrote very uh, relaxed and calm. So that's a great outcome for these types of practices. It's amazing how much even a short 
kind of stopping and moving into being rather than doing can have an impact on that. And for other people, it might not have been relaxing at all. So I just also want to name that. So mindfulness is an awareness practice. So it will make you more aware of however things are for you. And that's important because if we become aware of things, even things that we don't like that much, that gives us the information and the motivation to want to try to change those things. Like if we meditate and we're really, really stressed out and we notice the anxiety there, it might help us look at what's perpetuating this anxiety. What might need to change in my life? So uh, I just like to say, if your practice isn't relaxing, it doesn't mean it's not beneficial and it doesn't mean that you're not doing it right. Um, practice might not be relaxing depending on how how your day has been, how things are. Somebody wrote, I felt a lot like when I was trying to learn TM, uh, would, would you consider the practice, your practice a form of TM? So this is a great question. A lot of people have uh, maybe heard of transcendental, transcendental meditation, also called TM. And um, TM is a concentrative practice. So there's different, there's kind of a couple different types of practice. There's concentrative practice and then there's mindfulness practice. And the concentrative practice has actually, they all impact different parts of the brain, which is really cool too. So we know with like concentrative practices, like the body scan, anchors of attention really is more of a concentrative practice as well. Um, and TM often has a mantra that people are staying with and repeating that helps build the gray matter in the brain where there's concentration which is really cool. It also has some benefits to stress reduction. Um, so it's a great practice and concentration can really help kind of settle and collect the mind. Um, sometimes I like to think of this analogy as if you took a cup filled with water and you shook it up, there would be all this frenetic energy. And I don't know, maybe some of you feel like that, like the mind is like that sometimes and the body is like that sometimes. And then if you put that cup on the shelf for a while, the sand would start to settle and the clarity of the water would improve. And when we're, when the mind is given just one thing to do, like just pay attention to your feet or your breath or a mantra that, that helps the mind to actually collect and to settle. We are not actually even designed to be multitaskers. So like everything that we learned in the nineties, um, <laughs> it was not actually that good for us, but that we're good monotaskers and that tends to collect the mind. So that's what, um, concentrative practices can do. Mindfulness practices have different impacts on the mind and mindfulness practices are where we give kind of momentary awareness to things as they're arriving moment by moment. And, um, and we didn't do that specific practice today. So it's a little bit hard to point to, but it, it helps us develop things like self-referential processing, perspective, taking memory processing. So, uh, deals with different parts of the brains, the brain, but are equally beneficial. So that's a great question. Uh, it says, yes. I'm glad to learn that 45 minutes is the ideal amount of time. I've been doing 10 minutes here and there and found it wasn't really working. I'm going to be increasing to 45 minutes as the goal. That's great. I'm so happy to hear that because I do feel like a lot of people, actually, we know that apps have really, really high rates of people that don't continue them. And I think this is one of the, the challenges that people might feel just not have enough information to know how much is the right amount to actually get a benefit? And I bet even 20 minutes, if 45 feels like a big ask, uh, would you'd start to notice a difference as well. But 45 minutes has a different impact than 20 minutes. Um, so I think that's that's great that you'll experiment with that a little bit. Hey, everybody. I wanted to say thank you that those two questions were actually some from the list that I have. It was what's the difference between mindfulness and other types of meditation and what's a good idea time frame on how to, how long to practice. So um, next question in the chat coming up, should you plan a time of day to do this or as needed? Yeah. So this is a great question. And I would say that this is your experiment. <laughs> it's um, everybody's body is just a little bit different and everybody's schedule and lives. So I think it's a good idea to experiment with different times of day to see what actually works best for you or is most um, doable. I think the most important thing is 
when can you actually carve out the time for the practice and get to it fairly consistently? Um, I know I've always had this dream of being a morning meditator and I just want to go back to sleep when I'm meditating in the morning. <laughs> and so I, I tend to do it before I go to bed at night and, um, and that's not how I would have ma- imagined it. So I would say it's a really good idea to, to experiment. I'm seeing also Elizabeth's comment. Yeah, even though I have not done well doing 20 minutes of mindfulness every day, a mantra, a mantra has helped dramatically, helping to fall back asleep during periods of waking at night. That's funny that I have a question that's exactly that. It was about what being up awake in the middle of the night is mindfulness helpful to fall back to sleep. So sounds like yeah, a, that's a great question. And I would say it can be. So for some people, when they meditate, they might get more energy. And if you're one of those people, it's probably not going to be the best go-to when you wake up at night. But for many people, just um, often the reason that folks kind of wake up at night, it has something to do with our stress response. So there's this kind of, uh, the mind is maybe being a little bit hypervigilant about things. And so helping it have just one thing to focus on can be really effective for helping uh, the body go back to sleep. So something like a body scan or any one of these anchors and just keeping, bringing the mind back over and over as it drifts off can be helpful in falling asleep. Awesome, thank you. Uh, I have another question here. Um, How important is having a teacher? Yeah, so this is a great question. I think personally, after having, I taught, I have taught a form of mindfulness for many years that has a teacher as a component. And I can say from my own experience before I, um, did mindfulness-based stress reduction myself, I had a book about the program and I, I tried it. And I, then I was like, no, this is not going to work for me on my own. I feel like I really need to be, um, with someone that can help kind of guide me and, Um, I think one of the best things about a teacher in any form is that there's someone that have, they've been doing the practice for a while. And so they can help you navigate the places where you might know, not understand, or you might get stuck or where you think, oh, maybe I'm just not getting this quite right. So I think there's a huge amount of value in having a teacher, at least initially when developing a practice. And I also think there's a huge benefit in being with a group of people. I've, I've seen that be one of the main components of effective learning as I've been teaching mindfulness over many years is that people get so much out of the, the group of people that they're learning with as well um, to know like, oh, they're having the same challenge as me, as me or hearing their insights or seeing the progress people are making. I think both um, a class and a teacher are really, really helpful components of cultivating a practice. And again, we know that apps often don't have that component and they have a much higher uh, rate of people not sort of succeeding. So if you think about uh, what are the best methods to succeed and what's been really effective, that's a proven um, effective way to learn. Yes, thank you so much. Um, Here's a question. What are the top three hindrances to sticking with a mindfulness practice? So, I mean, time tends to be a really challenging one for many people in my experience. And I would say, again, like this is really a discipline. I think sometimes people look at mindfulness like, oh, it's just going to be this relaxing thing. And it leads to relaxation and stress reduction. That's sort of a side effect But carving out the time in people's busy lives seems to be a problem, like maybe the number one challenge I see. And so I would really encourage everyone in here to think about, you know, all the things, all the time that you're giving to the people in your life and the work that you're doing and the ways that you're serving the community. And this is just 20 minutes for you during the day. And um, so that can sometimes help people make different choices about, you know, even the ways that we might be using our time. Like, are there 20 minutes you're putting to something that's not nourishing that you could put towards this? Falling asleep can be another big one. Um, So that, you know, practicing with the eyes open or in postures where you're not overly comfortable and you're just going to immediately drift off can be helpful. Like sitting 
can be a good way to practice. Um, and I'm trying to think what's another common one. The mind wandering, I think is another, especially as you're beginning in, 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 in meditation can be another one to, to try to attend to. And just to know that it can take time for the mind to settle and that if it's wandering off, that's fine. I, I, again, I like to think this is the practice of a thousand beginnings. We're not practicing for an outcome. We're practicing for the sake of practicing, for building the muscle to stay present, to stay connected to our experience, no matter what our experience is. And that, that is why um, this helps us in our life. Because we're actually training to build capacity to meet whatever is arising, whether it's pleasant or unpleasant, because life is all of it. And John Kabat-Zinn said a quote one time that really struck me. He said, if this is your whole life, why not show up for it? Even when it's challenging, even when it's not that pleasant, is there a way to show up skillfully and to respond skillfully? I see another question in the chat as well. Is there more yeah. benefit to a group meeting in person rather than virtually? I mean, I taught for many, many years in person and I'm teaching now mostly virtually. And I have found, I barely noticed the difference. It's like the impacts seem to be the same on, on people. The sense of community that develops tends to be the same, but I would say it depends on the container of the virtual community. So in, in my classes that I teach online, everybody can see each other and everybody's communicating and, um, and being a part of the group. So I imagine um, those are probably the best types of venues where it feels as much like in-person as possible. Great. Um, here's a question from your slide earlier. You showed some like, some like that bell curve of like good stress and then maybe bad stress. What are some examples of having good stress? Yeah, so good stress, you know, often when I use that um, U-shaped curve, a lot of people have probably thought about that in the context of sports before. Like, you know, people want to be training hard before they're going to perform at like a race or a competition. And then you don't want to overtrain where you start to get injured. And that's the same for us. Like if you've been through academic programs, you might be studying for a test or in your work life, there might've been times that were busy, but in a, like a healthy way, you had deadlines, but they weren't um, too exhausting or put too much pressure on you, but they can help you actually perform well. Uh, because at the very bottom of that list is like boredom. Like we would not get out of bed or try to find food or, you know, do any of those things. So even the, the things that happen in our body, like hunger, provide a certain amount of stress so that we can meet them. So there's a lot of healthy stress. And I always encourage people to start to think about what are the signs that you've moved beyond that to the imbalance zone? And I wonder even now if people might be willing to say, when do you notice, what are the, some of the signs of imbalance for you? I know for me, it could be, uh, maybe I'm getting more easily irritated more quickly. How about for others? Maybe in the chat. Sleep can be another one, like not sleeping as well, eating junk. Yep. So that's another one that could be there. Um, Lots of different signs that might give us a sense we're imbalanced, eating too fast, getting a knot in the stomach or in the middle of my back pain. Absolutely. Tension. A lot of people report tension. So if we can start to notice those signs and then do something like a mindfulness practice, it can help us self-regulate more quickly so that we don't land in burnout. That's great. Um, with our time remaining, I know, Colleen, you mentioned that you had a slide with some resources on it. So I had a question about that, like about books that you might recommend. Yeah, let me move back to the slides. I was thinking this was a good time for that too. Mm -hmm. So, okay, so here are some resources that could be supportive. So of course, we've talked already about developing a daily practice. Um, the mindfulnessstandard.com has different qualified teachers that have programs online and in person. Um, and that can be a resource to help you find a mindfulness-based stress reduction program or even mindfulness self-compassion. 
I offer programs. Um, the next virtual program will be in the fall. And so I put uh, my website address there as well. Um, we also offer a corporate mindfulness challenge, which is really cool. It has a teaching component. It's scalable for larger organizations. So, um, but it has the same teaching components of having a teacher in, in the group. Um, and then somebody mentioned this way back at the beginning, just taking a few moments, five to 10 minutes to stop and notice your breath. Um, if you have like busy work days or just a busy life, um, just maybe even using that time during transitions, like before going to work or before coming home, or if you're involved in a lot of activities, maybe in between those. So, or, or mindful eating or mindful drinking of your favorite cup of coffee in the morning, something like that. You could do things like mindful driving. I feel like everybody should practice this one. That would be probably beneficial for all of us. Uh, mindful walking, going for a walk and taking in the sights and the smells and the sounds, um, listening to others and really hearing. Uh, so, so many different ways that could really be translated into all aspects of our daily life. And then um, some really great books that are out there. John Kabat-Zinn wrote a book about mindfulness-based stress reduction called Full Catastrophe Living. It's great. Um, and it's been updated like in the last 10 years, I want to say, as a lot of the new neuroscience. Um, the 10% Happier app is one that I think is really well done. Calm.com, Headspace. Insight timer is a little bit like the Wild West. Um, I, I like it a lot because it has a timer that if you don't want to hear someone guiding you, you can set like a little ringtone um, and it will start your meditation and end it. As far as the meditations that are on there, they have some really well-respected teachers. And then some people, I have no idea if they're qualified at all. So um, I would say as far as like the content on Insight Timer, that's a little harder to navigate than the other three that are listed there. So, um, and then I just have one last, uh, slide here. I wanted to put up and I will stop the share again. It looks like there's a few more questions in the chat and we have about three minutes left. So, oh, good people. I love the mindful coffee. Great. Oh, Rick Hansen. Yeah. He's amazing. That's another really, really great resource. Um, and I see some other other folks putting things in the chat box of resources they know of as well. So that's awesome. Any last questions? We have maybe two more minutes. Okay, well, this has just been such a great interactive group of folks to work with. So thank you so much for your time and for, for being here today. Awesome, Colleen, I wanna say thank you and thanks for everyone for joining us on BioBytes. We also dropped into the chat next month's BioBytes with Guy Odishal for the Heart Rate Variability Program. So we were talking about that earlier about how mindfulness can manage some of the stressors and highs and lows of our day. So that might actually be something that could tie into your mindfulness practice as heart rate variability. Um, so this is fantastic. I wanna say thanks to everybody for joining. Um, you're welcome to, to make your voices heard as we sign off again, but we'll close it out at 12.59. Thanks again, everybody.